We're so excited to get to speak on this topic. I'm Lisa, and then um, this is Stephanie here. And as Kelly mentioned, we're both second year students um, at Bastyr. And besides that, we both work part time and we're also volunteering in the area. So we stay pretty busy and um, really are looking for ways to cook healthy on a budget. It's something that's really relevant to us as students. And it's something that we're both just really passionate about. Um, as individuals and a common question that we get and that comes up a lot is is it possible to eat healthy on a budget and oftentimes eating healthy on a budget can become synonymous with spending more money on your food and we're really here to dispel that rumor and kind of show you some ways that that it's possible um, and also just kind of as a disclaimer, this is definitely a survey of healthy eating on a budget. It's going to be a little bit more general. We really wanted to cast a wide net and get as much information in as possible. Um, and so with that, if you find that you have more specific concerns or things that are more relevant just to you as an individual, the Bastyr Clinic is a great place to start. So we're going to be switching microphones quite a bit during the evening, so bear with us as we share. Tools. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we recognize that um, some of you may be at different points in in planning efficacy or um, really knowing shortcuts to uh, uh, to budgeting and saving money. Um, and so, for some of you, these concepts that we're going to be talking about will be quite familiar and. For you folks, we'd like to be able to provide a few resources and ideas to capitalize on what you already know. For other people, this, these um, strategies for saving money will be all new, and we're going to be throwing out quite a few ideas with the hopes that you can incorporate one or two or three of them and start being able to save money on your grocery budget. And so to help us get a gauge for where you're at, we thought we'd actually throw it out to the room to see what some of you have come here to find out. And we'd, we'd actually like to make a little list um, uh, of your ideas, your thoughts, um, or kind of what's top of mind for you when you think of saving money. So we're going to write um, we're going to write your ideas on the board really quickly, and then we'll go through our talk. And hopefully, we'll address most of them during the talk. But if there are some that are left over and we have a little time, then we'd really like to uh, make it an effective time here for you too. So who has who has some thoughts on what they're here to learn? Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. So. Okay, great. So, um, uh, exploring the dirty dozen and the clean fifteen. These are um, these are groups of the most heavily um, pesticide laden fruits and vegetables that are published each year. Um, we're definitely going to go over that, and we'll have some resources for places to go um, and ways to find some organics. So great. Anything else? Yes. Lower cost organic produce, great. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, foods that are easy transportable. Foods that are portable. Meat in moderation. Mm -hmm. These are great ideas, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> uh, yes, go ahead. Foods that keep. Foods that keep up. Okay, great. And yes. The real truth about B12 and protein. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I think we saw a hand back there. Cutting back my gluten-free budget, because I have to eat gluten-free. Cutting back your gluten-free budget? Yeah. Or minding your gluten-free budget, since, it, since yeah. those gluten-free foods are so expensive? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about, like, organic versus, versus natural? Organic versus natural, okay. Mm-hmm. 
as opposed to organic versus conventional, the word nat natural. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think we'll take two or three more. Uh, oh, sir? Yeah? Ma I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Um, I've been cooking for like, you know, 50 years. I just kind of wanted some new ideas. New ideas. Okay, we've got places to go for new ideas. <laughs> yes? I was interested to learn more about processed foods and why those are negative. Mm -hmm. You got it all, Lisa? Yeah. Okay, processed foods, the downside. <laughs> and yes? Um, food combining. Food combining? For complementary proteins, that kind of thing, or for uh, balanced for your meals. Digestive, for your digestive system, which one you can take or eat at the same time, and which one you should not. Okay. What's the best combination? Combinations of meals. Yeah. For, for digestion. Yeah, we'll take. We, I think we have room for one more here, and then we can we can also go on the on the back side too. Yes, sorry. Mine was just where to start when you're yeah. changing your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Where do you start? Okay. We have the starting point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great, Great. Thank you for your ideas. Yeah. Sorry, we can't, don't have time right this moment to um, write down more, but we, let's, uh, we'll, we'll definitely have some time toward the end of the presentation, so. Um, now presenting our kind of roadmap to healthy cooking on a budget for the evening. And this is just organized sequentially based on kind of where you would find yourself. So make a plan at home before you go to the grocery store, before you start any of the actual shopping. Um, number two, being a savvy shopper, so you made it to the store, just kind of some tips and tricks and things to think about. When you're at the store, um, money stretching in the kitchen speaks sort of for itself. Um, some recipes and resources, and then last we will have a little cooking demo and tasting of some low budget and healthy delicious foods for you, which are warming right here. Um, and also just to mention the resource pack which you all have in front of you, it's something we'll be referencing throughout the talk and it's an awesome thing that we really hope that you consider taking home and kind of keeping with you as something you can use or if something piques your interest then chances are that we've expanded a little bit on it in the resources. So just kind of something to keep in mind as we're moving through the talk. Next slide. Oh yeah. Um. You have to switch. The okay, mic. we do need to switch the microphone around. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we pretty much are. Kind of. Okay. So the very first step in trimming your your grocery uh, bill is to find time to do it, and this requires um, setting yourself up for success. Sorry. <laughs> setting yourself up for success by time blocking. You need to be able to find a little bit of time in your week where you can focus on multiple meal planning, shopping, and cooking. And this may sound like a daunting task. Um, your eyeballs may be rolling to the back of your head thinking, where am I going to find the time to do this? Uh, my, my schedule is already pretty nuts. But we like to think of this step as really reallocating the time that you have. Because if you can proactively plan a few consecutive meals and do a little cooking ahead of time, you're going to save time in the long run by not visiting the grocery store as many times during the week or the drive through as many times during the week. The major goal is to stay out of the grocery store. <laughs> because the more you can stay out of the grocery store, the more money you're going to save. So. Um, some ideas for time blocks that might be available to people would be Sunday afternoon. Often that's downtime, um, and it's a great time to put a few different meals on the stove or in the oven at once. 
Um, just think about multitasking in the kitchen. You ca it's pretty easy to capitalize on your time by cooking a lunch and a dinner and another dinner um, when you've got a few hours. Um, also consider this. If you have one hour available in the morning to get ready, it takes exactly the same amount of active time to put on a pot of brown rice as it does to make a pot of coffee, one minute. So as you're getting ready, by the time you're out the door, you've already got a large, portion, uh, large portions of brown rice available for you. Uh, for later, you can just stash them in the fridge and deal with them and portion them out um, when you get home from work. Um, one other idea might be if you're spending a couple minutes in the morning making oatmeal, maybe spend a couple more minutes um, making some couscous or some quinoa or some corn grits. These are all very quick cooking grains that are pretty easy to, to slap into a pot. Um, and you can be preparing your breakfast and a good, part, a good healthy part of your dinner um, at the same time. So um, most people need a little bit of inspiration when the words meal planning come together. <laughs> and so there are two good places to start um, when, you're, when you're considering meal planning. First of all, um, you, it, it, would help if you, it will help if you can shop for deals. And in your handout, we've provided a list of most of the major grocery stores' weekly deals website connections. Um, so you don't have to go far, just plug in to what's already on sale at your local grocer. Um, once, you find these website, once you find these sites, you can like them on Facebook, you can, at, you can uh, put them on Twitter, so that you have a constant stream of information about what's on sale um, coming right to you. Um, the second uh, part of the meal planning equation is finding recipes, finding things that are easy for you to cook that you know you can cook. And um, so we've provided, at the back of your handout, quite a few um, recipe websites to check out. They vary in cooking ability from things that can be cooked in five minutes to things that cost under five dollars to make to very elaborate meals. And hopefully if you um, surf some of those websites you might find some recipe inspirations. So now that you've got your weekly deals, say you've found that um, two for one chicken, you can, buy you can buy one get one free chicken at QFC. Um, you know that you're going to build some meals around chicken. You've gone to the recipe websites. A couple of these re recipe websites actually um, fe have a feature where you can just plug in an ingredient and out will pop several recipes um, with that ingredient. So it's really easy. Um, uh, so you've got your, you know what you're going to make for the next few days. And the next thing that uh, is very helpful is to create a shopping list. I know. Genius. But um, <laughs> uh, if you have some ideas in mind for recipes and you try to wing it, there's a greater probability that you're going to forget something, one or two ingredients, which is going to send you back to the store and you're going to end up guaranteed spending more money. So if you make a list at the beginning, um, it's just going to help you with time efficiency and, and money saving. And so we also have um, just a template for weekly meal planning along with a basic shopping list included in your packet to get you started. This is just sparkpeople.com. There are dozens of on-site or on, on um, websites with with shopping list templates. Some people just have something posted to the fridge and they just jot things down as they go with what they need. But getting in the habit of making a shopping list, it's old-fashioned and it's it works. <laughs> um, let's see, I guess we've gone back to so. Uh, a couple of considerations when you're um, out shopping, um, especially with produce, it really pays to consider seasonality because pr uh, produce, um, when it's in season, costs less. It's more delicious when it's ripe and it has more nutrients. And I don't, I don't know if this will work, but let's try it. <laughs> there are a couple of websites out there uh, PCC and Seasonal Cornucopia. Do you want to try that? Lisa? Oh, great, we've got it. Um, these are websites where you can plug in any month of the year, and we've plugged in, Lisa has plugged in vegetables and fruits throughout the year, and the nice thing about Seasonal Cornucopia is that it features locally grown produce. So things that are native to uh, this region are the things that will be featured on this website. So for people who 
who like to shop the farmers markets, like to get deals, and like to shop locally. Um, Seasonal Corp Cornucopia is a great website. Um, they've got they they um, they have information on more than just fruits and vegetables. I just we just wanted to sort of give a shout out to them um, because we think they're a really good website. And the other thing that's great about this site is, for me, it always makes me hungry for fruits and vegetables that I wouldn't think about buying. So if I know that something's in season, I'll sort of stretch the repertoire and try some new things. Um, carrots, certain vegetables, carrots, cabbage, celery, and onions are reliably a better value. And it's really easy to chop up these types of vegetables and add them in bulk into what you're already cooking, whether it's a rice dish or a pasta dish for added vitamins, minerals, um, and fiber. And the city is dotted with independent produce stands. Um, you may have been driving around some of these for years without stopping by, but the cost is lower for produce at these independent um, market uh, or vendors than it is in grocery stores simply because they have lower overhead. So there's a list of, um, there's actually a list of, of these produce stands in your handout as well. Places like Rising Sun Farms, How How Market, um, in Ballard, there's Top Banana. So stop by. They do offer some organics. Um, their main focus is on um, just cheap produce. <laughs> um, a lot of a lot of the produce, a lot of these outlets comes from Yakima, so it's fairly lo fairly local. Um, but it, for those who are interested in low cost um, organic, this, these are some good outlets to try um, shopping. So. Um, so moving on to the savvy shopping section, um, the first point here is more specific to the farmer's market and then kind of from there we'll, we'll address things that are more relevant to grocery store shopping. And so the farmer's markets, A, we have awesome farmer's markets around here and we have a lot of them and most, a lot of them um, are, are year round and so you can get local produce almost any time. The Ballard and the U District ones are two that come to mind that are year round. So A, that's awesome. And often I think that the farmer's markets get a little bit of a reputation of being more expensive or being unaffordable. And uh, for Steph and I, we've kind of found some ways around the, um, the cost of the farmer's market. And so sharing those with you, um, the first one is shopping late in the day. Um, oftentimes, especially towards the end, the vendors are looking to offload whatever extra produce they might have. Um, they don't want to bring it back. And so taking it, or they'll sell it to you um, at a premium, and sometimes they'll just kind of throw a little bit extra in there, and you feel like you got this screaming deal. Um, the downside is sometimes there's a little bit of a limited selection, but for the cost savings, it's well worth it, because um, you get all of that great nutritional um, local produce. Uh, the second one is buying second. So often if you look just kind of down, tucked to the side of a bin or of a farmer's tent, you'll see this number two and there's kind of just slightly bruised tomato or a little bit of an ugly squash, but the, all the nutrition is intact and all of the great benefits of the full price items are there. And so that one is often, um, I suggest going early because those are popular, but it's awesome and if you're making a pie or if you're making a casserole it doesn't matter what the squash looked like before it got put in so that's fun and then the third is um, canning or jam flats and that's a picture of one down in the corner there and if you know that you love tomatoes or berries then those are great option you can usually buy them at a 50% cost because you're buying a bulk if you can't quite eat all of those right away usually We'll share one with a friend or put the other half in the freezer and pull it out in the winter when you're really craving a fresh summer tomato. So just kind of to touch on some farmer's market strategies that we love. Um, and so someone mentioned the question of, oh, did someone have a question? No. Um, next, uh, when is organic worth the extra money? And someone mentioned the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 and so glad um, that you mentioned it. That's, that's kind of a great place to start with the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. And so 
Dirty Dozen Clean 15 is put out by the Environmental Working Group, and they're a nonprofit organization that works to promote low cost, healthy eating. And um, we included one in your packet, and it's something that comes out every year, so um, we just keep ours on the fridge, and so you kind of know what's, what's good, what's bad. But definitely, if you're considering organic, work, having the Dirty Dozen as um, a place to start for organic produce is, is a really good thing. Um, I don't always bring my Dirty Dozen Clean 15 list to the grocery store with me, so kind of as a general rule, just um, something, anything that has a skin is maybe something that's worth considering to purchase an organic version of because the skin is where you're gonna get all of that pesticide exposure. Um, and moving, Can I ask a yeah, sure. I, I don't know what this means. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And so you see on the Dirty Dozen side, there's 12, and those are the 12 most pesticide-containing vegetables and fruits um, that the Environmental Working Group has found for this year. And so those are the ones that you, if possible, maybe choose organic on if you're making, if you're weighing your priorities. Um, and then the Clean 15 is typically going to be a little bit safer and I think you notice a trend, there's peels on them, and so you can, <laughs> you can peel it off and you can usually get a safe pesticide-free product from, from that. Does that answer your question? Okay, awesome. Um, and then, oh yeah, go ahead. So you're saying that the dirty dozen changes yearly? Yep, that's correct. They come out with a new one every year. Does and it doesn't... Uh, yeah, and I think, I don't, I don't know why it changes, but they do come out with an annual list, and so, yeah. They're constantly testing yeah. just the pesticide residues, and they're, they don't change much, yeah. but they do change somewhat. It's not, a, it's not a completely new list year to year. Mm -hmm. we're, we're keeping up on each year. Yeah, we change it to the next slide. Thank you. So, um, homemade versus processed food. Foods. Um, what I'm curious just to pull the audience. What definitions of whole food have you guys heard or have come up? Anyone? What's a whole food? What it, what's what kind of definitions would you use for a whole food? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean we could stop right there. That's it. A whole food is wholly intact, and a processed food is somewhat unintact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you mean like a watermelon without seeds sort of thing, or? Um, I think without getting into too much, it would probably be safe to call that a whole food. Um, right, and that's kind of why I wanted to not go too far down that. <laughs> that road, but yeah, I, I do agree with your point, for sure. Uh-huh. they're not necessarily genetically, well, they are genetically modified. Mm-hmm. They fall into the category of whole food, but mm -hmm. they are processed foods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't know the specific answer. Um, I think just kind of from our, you know, 5,000 degree perspective, we'll keep it a little more general, but I do still, I do agree with the bringing up the GMO thing is, is definitely a good valid point, especially with our upcoming voting. So um, coming a little bit back to this, um, the health benefits of whole foods are vast, and I'm sure you guys have heard quite a few of them, but it's just associated with a better overall health outcome to choose the whole foods. Um, without going into too much detail, there's just a laundry list of of reasons, um, reducing colds, cancer, digestion, mood, um, plus just the peace of mind that you're giving yourself all the nutrients it needs to, to run correctly and happy. So um, food is processed and it's processed for convenience and it's also processed to add longevity or also for safety reasons, so to prevent bacteria. Um, to do this, you have to add something to the food. So you're adding a filler or stabilizer or salt or sugar. Um, just to throw a few numbers at you, 75% of our salt intake comes from processed foods versus 20% from salting our food. Um, most canned soups and sauces have added sodium, but we often consume much more than what is recommended. Um, even if a food is labeled low sodium, interestingly, chances are it is containing more salt than you would use at home. 
Um, and sugar isn't just in processed sweets, it's added to bread to give it that appealing brown hue. It's found in jarred pastas, sauces, and cereal. It can be listed as anything from pure cane juice to maltose, brown sugar, corn syrup, cane sugar, honey, fruit juice concentrate. Um, fat is added, it helps give shelf stability, body, people like the flavor of it. Um, so from a cost perspective, buying prepared foods means paying for the convenience of having them prepared versus whole foods, you aren't paying for convenience and convenience is a really high part of the markup of a processed food. Um, so this next slide is, um, and from here kind of, these slides are a little bit more specific to grocery store strategy. And so um, this is an example of unit pricing and have, Raise a show of hands, has anybody ever used unit pricing to determine cost? Great, oh, so you guys are all on top of this. Great, well, I'll really, I'll just kind of touch on this slide a little bit more briefly, but it's an awesome way if you haven't started using it to save money when you're debating between two products, because it just bas basically breaks down the per unit price of an item when you're debating between, and so it can just be a really quick way if you're deciding between uh, this side, this corn and this corn. <coughs> which one is going to save you the most money. And so... A lot of, I'm noticing a lot of the stores are not using that anymore. Mm-hmm. The legislation has tapered off a bit on... On using on the unit pricing. Yeah. yeah, and that's a good point. And it's something that, um, if you're really interested in, you can, you can do it on your own. I sometimes will just take my little phone calculator and just do it right there in the aisle because I think it's important and it's nice to know when you're getting the best deal when all other kind of variables are equal. So. Buying in bulk. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. I was going to just mention too, um, talk to your store manager. A lot of them are really receptive to what their customers like and if you're vocal about it and it's important to you, um, changes can be made pretty easily at a lot of, at, at, I've noticed at, at, at grocery stores. So don't, you know, don't be afraid to let management know what's, a, you know, that you care about, um, about, about unit pricing. No, when their price is too high, yeah, well, yeah, onion, yeah, I can go over, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to buy it here mm -hmm. instead of from you. Yep. <laughs> They like yeah. feedback. Yeah. They they do. Yeah. Looking at their prices because how many people heard you say that to the manager? Mm -hmm. So good point. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about with savvy shopping is buying in bulk, and uh, there are a few staples that are available in bulk, including spices, grains, nuts, beans, and baking supplies that are. Uh, less expensive than canned and packaged staples, um, and they tend to be fresher because the inventory moves more quickly. So buying in bulk comes in handy for two reasons. First of all, I'm going to walk around a little bit. First of all, you can buy just what you need. So for the recipes that we're using today, um, you know, we didn't need a, a, bo a five-dollar bottle of paprika. We didn't need a six-dollar bottle of turmeric. Um, so by by being able to measure out exactly what you need, um, this, this coriander, I think, was 43 cents. So a big cost savings there. Um, so that's one aspect that's helpful with bulk buying. The other, the other place where bulk buying is really terrific is if you have a staple food that you like and you see it go on sale, you can really stock up and keep it in your pantry. Um, these foods store well. Um, and to talk a little bit more about that, most spices and grains can be stored in, a, uh, in an airtight container in, cool, um, in a cool, dry area for about six months. And nuts are a little more um, perishable. They contain fat, so they can go rancid a little quicker. So um, they're best kept stored airtight in the refrigerator. And kept that way, they'll last for four months. And you can also stash them in your freezer in an airtight container. And they'll, their shelf life is nine months or even longer. I've definitely pushed that. <laughs> is there a difference depending on whether they're roasted or uh, raw? Do you buy both? Um, do you typically buy both? Uh, not necessarily. It's just really about you, so you've got the so same freshness factor with both. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And then one trick when buying bulk is to take an extra 10 seconds and write what the food is on the label or the twist <laughs> tie because <laughs> coriander looks a lot like cumin and I don't know who here can tell the basil from the oregano. <laughs> I can't without looking at it. Um, also, uh, by writing the date and the year on it, you're guaranteed to remember when it is going to go bad. And if you don't have time to do it at the grocery store, it's very easy just to do it at home. Just label your jars and wash them when you're done. So. I know. It's okay. Okay. So, um, continuing on with our grocery store stat strategies, um, the first kind of tip to the trade is to stick to your list. And so, Steph made a great argument for going old fashioned and making a list, but actually sticking to it um, minimizes your impulse shopping purchases. So, stick to your list, it'll save you time and money in the store. Um, and then along the lines, the same lines, avoiding shopping while hungry. Um, even if you can just have a small snack, a handful of almonds, lunch would be preferable. Before you go to the grocery store, it's going to, again, minimize those impulse purchases and, and temptations. Um, and then for the next point I'd like to make, um, if everyone could just close their eyes really quickly for one moment and imagine you need to walk to the dairy case at your local grocery store, wherever you normally shop, and imagine the route that you take to get to your grocery store. And you can open your eyes, and just with a show of hands, how many of you have to walk to the back or the corner of the store to get your to the dairy case? A fairly decent number of people, and that is no coincidence. The way the grocery stores are typically laid out, places, the hot ticket items, the more high selling items, the things that people need to more frequently purchase at the perimeters of the grocery store. More focused in the center aisles, you'll find kind of the more processed foods, things that are typically more expensive per unit price. And so just keeping, just keeping in the back of your mind to, if at all possible, shop the perimeter of the grocery store because like a lot of things, it's, it's no coincidence the way that the grocery store is laid out. And never buy, never uh, buy the stuff on the end caps. Yes, that's a great point. They're usually more expensive. <laughs> and moving on to the next slide. Um, along the same lines of um, the way that a store is organized, a store is organized thinking about kids. Um, and so the most expensive foods are at eye level. That's no coincidence. Um, and has anyone, is anyone familiar with the nag factor or has anyone heard of that? It's, it's a thing. So, um, the nag factor is defined as the tendency of children who are bombarded with marketers messages to unrelentingly request advertised items. And this is a strategy that, um, is built into all of your pick your favorite corporate food com companies marketing strategy. Um, and there was a great study done at John Hopkins that um, showed that packaging characters and commercials were the main forces compelling kids to nag. Um, so again, if you can avoid it and you have kids, don't take them to the grocery store. If you <laughs> must take them to the grocery store, um, set a spending limit in advance or um, some of the local grocery stores allow the kids to pick out an apple or a banana from the produce. Um, so just being kind of mindful of that um, and just discouraging the purchasing of food that contains games or things that are promoting that nag factor. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Does anyone have any kids strategies that they've found work for them or, yeah? Uh, to play a game with the kid, maybe mm -hmm. looking for an unusual item. Oh, that's great. Yeah, make it more fun kind of experience. Yeah, thank you. Oh, really? The kids have to find something in the store while the other parent is shopping. Ah, well, there you go. Interesting. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, 
we're going to talk a little bit about money saving. So you made it home, you have your groceries, you stuck to your list, you had a snack before you went, and you are back in the kitchen. Um, so just kind of talking about some ways to stretch money there. The first one is batch cooking. And so batch cooking is an awesome way to save time in the kitchen and make eating whole foods easy. The idea is to make large batches of food in advance. Um, and so that way busy weekday meals will be speedy. Um, Similar to what Steph was saying earlier, a few approaches to this are to make multiple batches of whatever you would like on a Sunday afternoon whenever there's downtime. Another strategy is just to make double of whatever you're making for dinner and throw it in the freezer for later use. Um, we found in our house that doing this just once or twice a month, we have this like whole stockpile of soups and pastas and different casseroles ready to go. Um, and it's really exciting. You feel like you made a whole meal and five minutes. <laughs> feel awesome. Um, and freezing goes really hand in hand with that and so allowing you to store more long-term foods that have been prepared in advance. The procedure um, or the freezer just kind of lets you stock up when prices are low so kind of sticking to that grocery list this is the continuation of that allowing yourself to just freeze and store and then pull it out kind of when you need it later. What do you suggest if you live in an apartment and you have a a little one. Little yeah, space. that's definitely a we challenge. Don't have space to really, you know, do a lot of batch cooking. Yeah. Can I feel that one? Um, you know, the, old, the, the idea of just community cooking and sharing space with friends and neighbors is one that is really pertinent to this whole discussion. And if you can pair up and maybe trade off some space for some cooking, that might be a really good solution. If you'll do the cooking, you can store it next door or, you know, down the street or with a family member, that might be a good strategy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, a suggestion that reminded a question. So, um, sometimes when I run out of freezer space, somebody taught me, it works really well, is to store, li well, anything, but liquid things in a Ziploc bag mm -hmm. because you can make them really flat yeah. And they'll take up a ton less room than any container otherwise. But then I think about the plastic, and I, I think about <laughs> the spices too, plus the fact that spice bags you can't use usually reuse because <laughs> they're impregnated with whatever spices. But I was just wondering yeah. if that was pertinent or yeah. any comments about either, either the comment or the question. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to add? Uh, just, I, that is a great idea to uh, freeze liquid foods. Also, I know that people, if people are making batches of freezer jam or frozen mm -hmm. fruits to store them, um, it's worthwhile maybe doing a little bit of research to see if you can find a safe plastic that you're comfortable using. That might, that might help, um, you know, might help make, make you feel more comfortable actually going that route. And yeah, it's a concern. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any guidelines? Guidelines on finding um, freezing in Ziploc bags? Oh, um. you know what I like to do is uh, I like to take, if I'm, this is a little scary here. I actually, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what exact, I, you might want to bring, get, get a little bit of bleach water, but if you actually uh, suck out all the air, you're going to have an airtight container and it's going to last longer. I do that actually at home to help keep my frozen foods fresh. Stick a straw yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Right? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> so not just a straw, but use the little tiny coffee. Mm -hmm. little coffee stirring. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then just with the um, the concerns for plastic, I always cool our foods before we put it in plastic. And mm -hmm. I know it's not it's not a perfect solution, but for us, it's you just kind of have to weigh. Um, and so cooling the foods and then ensuring, not heating them in the bag are just kind of a few things that we like to do. Uh, we usually just put it in the refrigerator overnight and then we'll pack it the next day kind of thing. So, I mean, that's one way that it's a small thing, but yeah. Frozen food is unhealthy altogether.
think that kind of for our argument today, you have to, it's always a wait. And um, I think that for frozen foods, there's more benefit than. Yeah, than um, a, a couple of points on those. Some foods are made to be sold, they're picked at the peak of ripeness, and they actually hold, they do hold more nutrients. Um, when they're frozen, peas come to mind because they start to convert their sugar to starch immediately. So you're getting um, a very high quality. Um, they're just the, another top of mind food that holds nutrients very well frozen are wild blueberries. It's really hard to find blueberries in season and they're very expensive, but frozen wild blueberry um, nutrient content is right up there. So um, there definitely are some exceptions. Um, to the rule that freezing may drain a few nutrients. You have to read that label though on those blueberries and make sure they didn't add sugar. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so money stretching in the kitchen. Um, we talked a little bit about batch cooking and then using the freezer. Um, and then meatless Mondays and stretching animal protein. So um, we love to think of meat as a component of a meal and not necessarily the centerpiece. And so adding meat to a grain or a bean or a vegetable will is a great way to still get that satisfaction of having meat if that's something that you like to eat, but just letting it stretch a little bit further um, and kind of just thinking it as the component and not the centerpiece. Um, and some alternative um, proteins that kind of are great for, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Meatless Monday campaign. It's a great way to start if you want to start moving away from having quite as much meat in your diet. Just pick one day a week and Meatless Monday, it's built in. There's a really awesome website that has a lot of great creative ideas for um, meatless meals. But um, just kind of listing a few up there. And then also one that's not up there, but um, we really love is Portobello's. If you like the flavor and the taste of meat and that like carnet hearty texture, we'll put those on the grill or broil them with a little bit of whatever you would put on meat, like a barbecue sauce, and they're awesome and really satisfying and just a complete fraction of the cost. And so um, just considering that. You can take any of your, any of your uh, ground beef recipes. Yeah. Any of them. Yeah. And just chop up the portobello. Yeah. They're wonderful. It's really satisfying and it has delicious. The exact same texture. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. Um, and next is making new meals from old ones. And so Steph was kind of talking about getting a screaming deal on chicken at QFC, um, taking that chicken, roasting it, and then the next, you have chicken and rice, then the next two days later you can have chicken on the top of a salad or chicken enchiladas, and then the carcass of chickens makes the most fantastic, delicious homemade stock. Um, and doing that either in a lovely crock pot or doing it on a Sunday afternoon when you are home, is it's just so easy, and um, again, just cooling it down to refrigerator temperature and then we'll just store it in the freezer and it's a great way to make a new meal from an old one. Um, along the same lines, chili is an awesome one that you can batch cook quite a bit of and then the next day throw it in a wrap with some veggies and put it in a foil and you have a chili veggie wrap. Um, the last one, fresh veggies, they're kind of a little sad from that night's meal, throwing them in the oven the next day, roasting them up. Awesome, solid meals. You don't have to worry about the mics anymore. <laughs> we don't. We're good. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little, just a little bit about recipes and additional resources. Um, we mentioned before that there's a list of great um, recipe websites in your handout. And then to dovetail off of what Lisa was just talking about, we've provided some examples of great recipes in your packet um, for you to try.